welcome everyone. Uh, it's so great to see you all here, uh, new students, old students, uh, maybe future students. Um, uh, my name is Navya Gill. I'm a professor in the history department and the director of the Gandhian Forum for Peace and Justice. Um, before we get to today's event, uh, I should explain a little bit about who we are. Uh, the Gandhian Forum is a diverse group of faculty, staff, and students from across the university focused on promoting dialogue, analysis, and education on the most difficult questions of justice and peace in our time. In past semesters, we've organized events uh, ranging from Islamophobia in the U.S. Empire uh, to the crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, the politics of cannabis legalization, uh, and the struggle for universal health care. Uh, we're especially committed to drawing connections between the local and the global, so issues of everyday life and broader concerns about the wider world. As we shall soon see, um, the question of Kashmir sits precisely at the intersection of these twin mandates. Helps. Um, we're always open to both new ideas and new members, so if you want to get involved or learn more about us, please come see me uh, or members of the executive body uh, that are here. Um, now next, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the co-sponsors for the event. Um, we really appreciate the support we get, which allows us to put events like these on. Um, so thanks to the Office of the Provost, the College of Education, uh, the Departments of Africana World Studies, Anthropology, History, uh, and Political Science, uh, and the Asian Studies Program. Now to today's topic. Uh, the struggle for self-determination in Indian-occupied Kashmir. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Hafsa Kanjwal with us this morning. Uh, she is Assistant Professor of South Asian History at Lafayette College. Uh, Dr. Kanjwal received her PhD in History and Women's Studies from the University of Michigan. Uh, her research explores the history and politics of modern state building in Kashmir. Um, she's a founding member of Critical Kashmir Studies. This is an academic collective that promotes new and innovative scholarship on the region. Along with her scholarly work, uh, she's been active in the larger Kashmiri solidarity struggle, uh, speaking at various colleges and universities across the country, and writing, numerous popular, writing for numerous popular outlets, uh, such as the Washington Post, uh, Al Jazeera, and the BBC. Um, she's going to speak for about 40 or 45 minutes, uh, followed by plenty of time for discussion. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please remember them, or better yet, write them down, and then we'll have the conversation afterwards. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kanjwal. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to Professor Gill for the kind in introduction and also for inviting me to come um, be with you all today. I'm really looking forward to being here. Um, and also thank you to the Gandhian Forum for uh, supporting this talk. Um, so. A lot of you are probably here because you've heard that something has been going on in Kashmir. Um, and I will certainly be talking about that, what's happened um, since August 5th. I'll talk about the communication clampdown and the siege. Um, but because I'm a historian and because I believe history is important, I also wanted to give um, and start off by talking a lot more about the history of Kashmir and kind of situate it, um, especially from the perspective of, of Kashmiris themselves. Um, so. For many people, when you hear the word Kashmir, um, if you know where or what that means, um, you, it's often described as an India-Pakistan dispute or a territorial conflict between India and Pakistan, a nuclear flashpoint. Um, these are sort of the terms that we hear in both government, policy, and media circles. Um, and while, of course, it is a disputed territory between India and Pakistan, what that kind of framing usually does is erase the people of Kashmir themselves and their, um, and their own identities and their own dreams and their own aspirations. So when I kind of introduce Kashmir to, um, um, to students and to audiences, I kind of do so with this framing of the struggle for self-determination, um, because that is really how Kashmir's modern history has evolved. Um, a people who have, sorry, how do I move to the next? Oh, down there. Okay. Um, and I really situate it amongst uh, recurring themes, not just from 1947, which is when the partition of the Indian subcontinent happened, not even from um, the late 1980s, which is when the armed rebellion in Kashmir against Indian rule began, but also in much into the colonial period um, as well. So some of the recurring themes that you see in Kashmiri history are uh, a state that uh, has continuously and historically 
repressed, um, been uh, violent, killed, incarcerated, occupied, uh, corrupted, coerced, um, kind of ran a fake democracy and established no rule of law. And then on the other hand, the people have been silenced, violated, killed, incarcerated, criminalized, exploited, subjugated, isolated, and um, ignored. So these are kind of overarching themes that you'll see throughout, um, throughout the presentation. So of course, I wanted to kind of put Kashmir in a longer history and a trajectory in its pre-modern context. Before there was ever India and Pakistan, there was a place called Kashmir. Um, it has been a seat of different um, Buddhist, Hindu, and Muslim kings in ancient and medieval times. Um, its known archaeology goes back 5, 000, uh, to 5,000 BCE. Um, surviving written history goes back even um, to 2,500 BCE and has been connected because of its location, and I'll show a map a bit later, it's been connected to the Himalayas, um, Central Asia, Tibet, and Punjab. So it's really at the confluence of multiple civilizations. And um, Kashmiris have contributed um, their kind of literary and cultural legacy to both Buddhist, um, Hindu, and uh, Sufi or Islamic thought. Um, and what Kashmir is most often known for is its textiles or its, um, or its shawls, uh, paisley. So these are some of the cultural kind of production that um, people usually associate with Kashmir. Um, in, 19, in 1586, uh, Kashmir was conquered after being ruled by a series of Kashmiri um, Buddhist, Hindu, and Muslim rulers by the Mughal army. And this, in many ways, Kashmiris kind of conceive their loss of sovereignty or their loss of political power as actually going all the way back to the Mughals um, and uh, being defeated under the Mughals. Um, after the Mughals, uh, the Afghans and the Sikh kingdoms basically ruled over Kashmir. And um, the modern political history of Kashmir really begins in 1846. So in March 1846, um, Kashmir was ruled by uh, the Sikh kingdoms who ruled over Kashmir and Punjab. And um, there was a war um, between the British and the Sikhs called the Anglo-Sikh Wars. And a, a ruler, a warlord from the region of Jammu, which is part of the modern state of Jammu and Kashmir, um, he was a Hindu ruler from the Dogra family. He helped the British against the Sikhs. And in turn, the British basically rewarded him with Kashmir. Um, and this treaty was called the Treaty of Amritsar, where Kashmir was essentially sold to the Dogra warlord. And it officially became the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. So during the British colonial period, the British kind of oversaw certain territories in the Indian subcontinent directly, and then others were ran by princely uh, rulers, and Kashmir was one of them. And Dogra rule, as a lot of historians of uh, Kashmiri history have argued, was extremely repressive. In many ways, um, they conducted themselves in the, as a Hindu state, um, even though they oversaw a Muslim uh, majority population. And the Muslims, most of them were agriculturalists, they were peasants, they were part of the poor working classes, and they had to suffer a lot of economic exploitation, um, forced labor, political repression, and state-sanctioned state discrimination. Um, so they weren't able to get jobs in the Dogra administration. They weren't able to get educated. Um, most of them um, kind of lived as peasants. Even up until 1941, only 1% 1 of the Kashmiri Muslim population was considered literate. Um, so there was a lot of, um, a lot of repression that was happening to uh, Kashmir's Muslim majority population. And yet, at the same time, um, despite the state repression, in throughout the 1800s and the early 1900s, Kashmiris were fighting back. Um, so they were fighting for their economic, educational, and political rights. Um, one of the kind of key moments in which this happened was in 1865, where uh, Kashmiri shawl uh, laborers, weavers, um, fought back against some of the heavy taxes that were imposed on them. A similar thing happened in 1924. Um, and then in 1931 is when Kashmiris really believe that their freedom struggle begins, way before uh, 1947. And this is when um, Kashmiri Muslims who had gone outside of Kashmir to study in different parts of India because they could not get educated in Kashmir, came back and started to demand better economic and educational opportunities. And they were joined by some of the other communities in Kashmir, including Sikhs and other Hindus, and they basically protested against the Dogra army. And on July 13, 1931, um, the Dogra army fired upon, upon a crowd of peaceful protesters and killed 22 people. Um, and these uh, this kind of moment really marks the, the start of the freedom struggle in many uh, in people's minds. 
This was a movement that eventually became a lot more inclusive. It just wasn't fighting for the rights of Kashmiri Muslims, but also all communities that lived in Kashmir. Um, and in 1946, uh, the leadership of the movement, parallel to what the um, what was happening broadly in the Indian subcontinent with the Quit uh, Quit India movement against British colonial rule, um, these this Kashmiri leadership began a Quit Kashmir uh, movement against their Dogra overlords. Um, so these are just some images of what that Dogra repression looked like. Um, in the top image, you see Kashmiri peasant women um, and then a Dogra army official behind them. And the bottom image is actually of the 1931 uh, massacre um, against those who rebelled against the Dogras. And what's interesting about these images, especially the bottom one, is you'll see a lot of similar images in some of the photography that I'll show you with you know, young men being killed and their mothers Willing family members and mothers kind of uh, at, their, at their side. Okay, so that then gets us to um, 1947 and partition. So for those of you who might not be totally familiar with partition, um, basically as the British are leaving the Indian subcontinent, they have created a mess. Um, and there is a demand for the state of Pakistan, um, a Muslim majority state of Pakistan and a Hindu majority state of India. Kashmir was a unique space that had a Muslim majority um, population, but ha was ruled by a Hindu ruler. And initially, uh, the Maharaja at the time, the Dogra ruler, his name was Maharaja Hari Singh, he actually wanted independence. Um, so he did not, wasn't really too keen in joining either country because he wanted to maintain his own political control. Um, so he signed a standstill agreement with both countries, um, but he was faced with a heavy rebellion in the region of Poonch, which is in modern-day Jammu, and I'll show you a map to kind of situate all of this. Um, and these were Jammu Muslims who uh, wanted, to want, again, were kind of fighting back against the Dogra Maharaja, and they were, um, they were killed. So historians say that up to 200,000 Jammu Muslims were killed in the Jammu massacre um, by the Maharaja and his right-wing militias. And another 250,000 Muslims were exiled into what is uh, today's Pakistan. And what's interesting is that this rebellion re rarely gets talked about in history um, because the Indian state wants to put forth a narrative that um, the Maharaja was legitimate, that he had the legitimacy in order to sign a treaty of accession with India. Um, but what ends up happening is that Muslims from northwest Pakistan, um, what is often re referred to as a tribal invasion, came into Kashmir and wanted to liberate it from the Dogra ruler. And um, they, uh, because they were coming, the Maharaja panicked. Um, he realized that he was going to lose control of the region. And so he turned to the Indian government for military assistance. And the Indian government basically let him know that they would be happy to help as long as he signed a treaty of accession to the government of India. Um, so the treaty was signed. Um, there's a lot of dispute over whether he signed it kind of under duress or well, whether he did it willingly. Um, but there is a treaty that exists. And um, the Indian government basically um, was to control of Kashmir on three primary matters, uh, foreign affairs, communications, and defense and everything else was supposed to be left to the local Jammu and Kashmir state. So the Indian army officially came into Kashmir on October 27th, um, and that is when India and Pakistan also went to war. And India gained control of two-thirds of Kashmir, and Pakistan gained control of one-third of Kashmir, and the region was um, split between the two countries. So um, the reason why this narrative is really contested is that the Indian state basically ignores that the Jammu massacre ever happened, and it uh, situates the Pakistani or the, tr uh, the uh, tribal invasion as one um, that is what caused the whole situation, that Kashmiri Muslims were perfectly fine, they were, would have been happy to join with India, but it's because of Pakistan's interference um, that things changed. So this is one kind of narrative that you'll kind of see throughout much of this 70 uh, 72 year history that everything is kind of placed on Pakistan and there's no understanding or recognition of Kashmiris themselves, in this case um, those who lived in uh, Jammu, um, kind of seeking their own agency and demanding um, their own sovereignty. So after the India-Pakistan War um, in 1948, India actually takes the Kashmir issue to the United Nations 
and the UN declares that there should be a cessation of hostilities, um, that there should be a demilitarization across the line of control, and an eventual plebiscite. And this really is the root of what is at stake, um, because this plebiscite never took place to this day. Um, and this is really what the Kashmiris on the ground have been demanding for the past 72 years. Um, subsequently, within uh, the part of Kashmir that was controlled by India, uh, the Indian government installed a series of client regimes um, that were for the accession, and they were um, mostly a Kashmiri Muslim, but also some Hindus and Sikhs leadership, part of the National Conference, which is a secular leftist party at the time. And they had given their approval for um, being a part of India as long as Kashmir was able to maintain its autonomy. And that autonomy was enshrined in something called Article 370, where uh, Kashmir would be able to have its own flag, its own constitution, um, its own legislative assembly that passed its own laws, and India would only take control of Kashmir's foreign affairs, defense, and communications. So Article 370 is what was revoked on August 5th, and I'll talk a bit about that, but just to kind of situate this in its historical context. Um, so some of these in, uh, images on this slide, um, the top image is of a Hindustan Times, which is an Indian newspaper, um, uh, on October 28th, so the day after the accession, and the Indian army came into Kashmir, which basically says Kashmir accedes to India, plebiscite soon on the ruler's decision, Sheikh Abdullah, who was the leader of the National Conference at the time, to form an interim government, and Union troops rushed to protect uh, further protection of the state. So I show this because, um, you know, India today, the state and its media establishment uh, uh, kind of insists that Kashmir is an integral part of India. But even their own newspapers from that time kind of show how this was a process that was in the making. There was nothing kind of natural about it. Um, it was very contingent on hist history as it was evolving. And the bottom image is of the Indian army in uh, Kashmir, what Kashmiris kind of believed to be their, um, a, a dark day for them when the Indian army c came in and officially occupied Kashmir. And then the picture on the bottom of the two men, um, the one on the right is Jawaharlal Nehru, who would become the first prime minister of India, and then Sheikh Abdullah on his left, who was the leader of the um, national conference at this time, one of the, the first kind of uh, installed politician. Okay, so this is a map then of um, the, the area within the pink is the entirety of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, which is what the British had cobbled up together and uh, given to the Dogras. Um, so you can see that the area in the orange um, is what is controlled by India. It's called, um, it was before August 5th called the, uh, the state of Jammu and Kashmir. It has three regions within it, the Valley of Kashmir, which is a Muslim majority um, and has uh, Hindu and Sikh populations as well. Um, Jammu, which used to be a Muslim majority in 1947, but most of those Muslims were either killed or sent into exile. So today it has both Muslim and Hindu populations. And then Ladakh, um, which historically was always very connected to Tibet and to China um, and has a, a Buddhist majority population, but also significant um, Muslim populations as well. Um, so that, that those three regions, regions make up of uh, the Indian controlled side of Kashmir. And then in the green is what Pakistan um, gained power over um, after the first war. And it consists of the northern areas, which is uh, now called Gilgit Baltistan, um, and the region uh, directly to the west of the valley is Azad Kashmir. Um, and the line in the green between, or in the black between them, the dotted line uh, was the ceasefire line, which is now the line of control. Um, there is another area that you see on the far east called Aksai Chin um, that used to be a part of Indian controlled Kashmir, but uh, China took it over in 1962 in the Indochina War. And that area is largely uninhabitable, um, but it is one of the reasons that China is also involved in some ways um, and has a vested interest in the, in the dispute. So um, the image, or the text on the right is the actual resolution of the, the UN resolution, which is what Kashmiris kind of continually um, hearken back to, the democratic method of a free and impartial plebiscite, to bring about a cessation of the fighting and to create proper conditions for a free and impartial plebiscite, um, and freedom of press, speech and assembly, and freedom of travel in the state. So this was uh, in 1948. And subsequently, there's been 11 additional UN resolutions that are essentially calling for much of the same. <clears throat> so this is um, a series of images from August 1953. 
uh, when Sheikh Abdullah, who was the first prime minister of the state, um, was deposed from power. So I mentioned Article 372 earlier, which is what was supposed to give Kashmir its autonomy. And it became very clear to the Kashmiri leadership at the time that India was actually not interested in preserving Kashmir's autonomy. So even though it only had control over three main areas, it was getting involved um, in Kashmir's financial and judicial and other matters as well. Um, so the leadership that had really believed that India would secure um, Kashmir's autonomy started to speak out against India. Um, and they were basically saying, Sheikh Abdullah in particular, that you know this issue has not been resolved yet, that yes, we've acceded to India, but um, the plebiscite is still on the table. Um, and because of that, um, he was, um, he was uh, uh, removed from power, and his second in command, someone by the name of Bakshi Ghulam Muhammad, was installed as the prime minister. Um, and these are images then from that time. And again, I want you to look at some of these images and the parallels that will exist with some of the later images. On the far left, there's a shutdown or a strike where people have been protesting that um, he was so unceremoniously removed from power. Um, there's forces or troops that are coming into villages to make sure that people don't protest. Um, and then there's a man on the right who's either been beaten up or tortured and you know, he, he's, uh, they've taken a photo of him. And um, after 1953, basically what you saw in Kashmir was a um, movement, a popular movement, a mass movement amongst the people who uh, were demanding a plebiscite. Um, so these are just some images of, um, of what that looked like. Um, they were peacefully protesting, um, trying to kind of use international law and the language of international law to demand their plebiscite, um, which was, again, never given. And then in 1984, um, the Indian state basically hung a popular leader um, uh, named Makbul Bad, who had actually started to envision the idea of independence for Kashmir. So for much of the 40s, sorry, 50s and 60s, um, the only two options on the table were India and Pakistan, because that's what the UN resolution um, called for. But Kashmiris started to realize, a group of Kashmiris started to realize that neither country actually had their best, best interests at heart and that each were kind of um, initiating their own national interests on them. So in the 70s and the er 80s, you actually saw um, Kashmiris speaking out more in favor of independence. Um, and it's these, uh, these people that actually began the armed rebellion. OK, <clears throat> so that phase is sort of the first phase of um, India's rule over Kashmir, which scholars call a constitutional occupation. Um, then we get into the late 1980s, um, which is what starts the Tehrik, or the movement, and is um, what is known as the military occupation. So in the late 1980s, there was an election in 18, or 1987 where um, Kashmiris were going to, uh, uh, basically there was a group that wanted to fight for elections, and if they had won, um, they would basically declare that Kashmir was independent of India. So they were looking to use the constitutional means and the electoral process in India to kind of extract themselves from, from India. Um, and that election was heavily rigged because India knew that it was going to be very popular and a lot of people were supporting this leadership. Um, and as a result, Kashmiris basically realized that their kind of peaceful constitutional struggle was not working. Um, and other things were happening internationally at this time. This was the um, end of the Afghan, or around the time of the end of the Afghan Jihad against the Soviets. Um, a decade prior, uh, the Iranian Revolution had begun. So throughout the region, there was sort of more revolutionary um, movements that were happening. Um, and the Palestinian struggle, the first intifada, had also begun against Israel. So Kashmiri young men um, formed something called the Jammu and Kashmir uh, Liberation Front, and they decided to take up arms against the Indian state. And they started to um, implant a series of bombs in military installations, um, and India basically responded quite heavily. So India brought in over 700,000 troops of its troops into Kashmir. Um, previously, the troops had been mostly in the, around the line of control on the border, um, but in this time, the troops were into the civilian areas. And uh, the, the rebels at the time uh, realized that they were no match for this army. Um, so they actually turned to Pakistan, which was all too eager to help. And they went across the line of control, got trained militarily, financially um, in Pakistan, and then came back. 
What happened at that time was that um, Pakistan not only trained the JKLF, but they also brought, which was a, a secular um, party that was for independence, it was a na nationalist movement, but they also sponsored the Hezbollah Mujahideen and other groups um, that were more Islamist or pro-Pakistan in their orientation. And there was an infighting then amongst these two groups um, because of their different visions. Um, but subsequently, there were a series of massacres um, in, in the Indian-controlled part of Kashmir. So these are just some of the names of the Golkadal Gol massacre, where up to 300 people were killed, Zakura, Tengpura massacre in the 1990s. Um, so people were basically taken to the streets, protesting, showing their support for the armed movement, and the Indian army was firing into the crowds and killing um, dozens of people at a time. Um, a couple of other really important things happened at this time. So in January 1990, Kashmir's uh, minority population of uh, Hindus, who were called the Kashmiri Pandits, um, they were forced to leave um, the Valley of Kashmir, which is where they'd lived with their Muslim neighbors for centuries. And there's a lot of contesting narratives about how and why this took place. Um, for the Pandits who lived in exile, as a majority, vast majority of them did after leaving Kashmir, um, the narrative is that they were um, threatened and that many of them were killed um, by their Muslim neighbors. Um, and that, you know, they left as a result of a genocide or an ethnic cleansing of their people, of their people. And this is kind of the narrative that the Indian state has picked up upon um, and weaponized against the Kashmiri Muslims today that are demanding freedom. Um, from the perspective of the pundits who remained in Kashmir, and there were about three to 5,000 of them, um, as well as the Kashmiri Muslims that were there, they acknowledged that there was a period of fear um, as a result of the armed rebellion and that certainly pundits, have, because they were a minority, must have felt fear, but that there were no targeted killings against the Kashmiri Pandit community. In fact, both Muslims and pundits who were seen as being a part of the Indian establishment or supporting the Indian establishment were killed by the, by the militants. Um, so this kind of remains one of the, um, like the dark periods of this whole process because many of the pundits grew up and lived in exile in camps in Jammu and other parts of India, um, have not been able to go back. And, um, and after August 5th, they've also kind of been mobilized to speak in favor of what the Indian state has been doing in Kashmir. Um, so I'd be happy to discuss that in the Q&A as well. Um, two other things that happened in this time was that India passed the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in 1990 where it basically declared that all of its soldiers would have complete impunity. So any human rights violations that the soldiers commit, um, they could not be held accountable for. So, and I'll talk about what some of those human rights violations are, um, but to this day, as a result of uh, AFSPA, as it's called, um, no Indian soldier has been uh, held accountable for any of their actions in Kashmir. Um, and in 1991, another tragedy happened where women, about 100 women in the villages of Konan Poshpura were um, gang raped by Indian army officials or Indian soldiers. Um, and they have narrated their tale. They've tried to take this to the courts and get legal, um, get this to be legal, legally addressed. but. The Indian state, its media, and its entire kind of military establishment has even denied that this ever took place. Um, so there's, there's a lot of sexual violence and rape that has also occurred as a result. Um, <coughs> so again, these are just some of the um, massacres and incidents that have happened since the 1990s. Um, and in 2000, the armed rebellion essentially ebbed away um, because India was able to quash it pretty heavily. And uh, for much of the 2000s, it seemed as if the Kashmiri movement for freedom had kind of settled down and that India had effectively quashed it. Um, but in late 2000, or in 2008, you saw a series of massive protests again, um, led by the generation, young people who had basically grown up during the, the period of the armed rebellion. And one instant that kind of sparked this um, was that the Indian state was trying to take land, actual land from Kashmir, and give it to a um, pilgrimage site, a pilgrimage board. And people were worried that the state was starting to begin a settler colonial project in Kashmir, um, which is what the concern is today as well. So 500,000 people basically came to the streets, were protesting, um, demanding again the UN referendum to be held. 
And this kind of began the next phase of the largely uh, nonviolent um, peaceful civil disobedience against India. So the summers of 2008, 2009, 2010, um, different instances happened that basically sparked more and more protests. Um, and then 2016, a really popular uh, rebel leader, Burhan Wani, um, was killed, which again in, in initiated a series of protests where hundreds of civilians were killed. Um, so really, much of this history has just been people protesting, getting killed, um, protesting again, and that cycle of violence has continued. Um, the picture on the bottom left is of a counterinsurgency group uh, called the Ikwan that the Indian state basically um, these were ex-militants um, who had been arrested that the Indian state used against the population. Um, so they also committed a um, vast series of human rights abuses against Kashmiris. And the picture on the right then is of one of these massacres, so what, what that would have looked like. Um, so these are just some images of militarization from the 90s on and so forth. Um, the one on the top left is uh, something that would happen uh, called a crackdown where all the men uh, would be asked to leave their homes and gather and uh, informers would sit behind these vehicles. Um, these are army vehicles. Um, there'd be an informer with a black mask on um, and the army would just kind of line up all of the men and the informer would have to let the army know who, which of these men was considered a, a militant, um, and then they would be taken away in custody or disappeared. Um, these, uh, this writing here with the fingerprints is of the, um, um, the legal kind of statement that the women who had been gang raped um, by the Indian Army, this is kind of them telling their, um, the story of what had happened to them, and these are all the different um, signatures of the women who had been raped. Um, because of the amount of violence that occurred at that time, um, there were a lot of mass graves that erupted in Kashmir, and this is one of them in Srinagar, the, capital, uh, the summer capital of Kashmir. And this is another image of a crackdown, what that, what that looked like. Um, this is from the funeral of the rebel leader that I had spoken about earlier, Burhan Wani, where really thousands and thousands of people defied um, the curfew orders that had happened after that he was killed. Um, to, to pray at his funeral. Um, and this is some of the images from the more recent um, agitations. So just army patrolling the streets, which is a very uh, frequent sight. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's 700,000 plus troops, Indian troops in Kashmir, and it remains the most militarized zone in the world. Um, and these are just Kashmiri students um, protesting. And what's been interesting is that usually the images that you see of young boys especially is of young boys kind of throwing stones and rocks at the army. Um, but in recent years, you've also seen Kashmiri schoolgirls. Um, these are just, I think, either in high school or maybe first or second year of college um, that have also been um, throwing stones. And the stone throwing is something that you'll kind of see in multiple contexts. It happens in Palestine as well. Um, and it started to happen after the 2010 agitations because the Indian Army would not allow mass civil protests to occur. They would fire live ammunition on them. Um, so these protests became much smaller and were kind of restricted to neighborhoods. Um, and the only way that you know, these young boys would basically come out, um, see the military deployment that was in their neighborhood, and then try to just throw stones at them to tell them to get, <coughs> get out. Um, but overall, the movement has been uh, also uh, using different kind of uh, modes of civil disobedience. So these women are protesting um, their family members that have been disappeared. So once a month, um, this organization of mothers and daughters of um, their male relatives that have been disappeared by the state meet and, and kind of have a silent protest to, to remember them and ask the state where they are, where their family members are. Um, since uh, 2016 especially, um, because uh, India got a bit of international criticism for, um, for using live ammunition into peaceful crowds, they have started to use something called a pellet shotgun. Um, and this is basically used on animals, um, and it kind of unleashes hundreds of lead pellets 
into the bodies of, uh, of the people that it's fired upon. Um, so it's led to um, what the New York Times called, or what the Guardian called the first mass blinding in the world, and what the New York Times called an epidemic of dead eyes. Because when they fire these pellet guns, they usually target above the waist, um, and it usually um, falls on the lead pellets go to people's faces and they're blinded. So over 1,200 um, Kashmiris, mostly young men, have been, have been blinded by these pellet guns. And you can see some of the images of what it looks like. All of these little dots are those lead pellets um, in people's faces and in their, in their bodies. And people have actually, India claims that this is a non-lethal gun, but if you actually fire it upon people's um, organs that they need to survive, they will, people have also been killed as a result of these pellet guns. Um, these are more images of what curfew days in Kashmir look like. Um, most of the businesses, et cetera, are closed. Um, there always remains some kind of a communication blockade. Internet gets shut down in Kashmir on a very frequent level. Um, India is one of the kind of the lead countries that has shut down the internet. I'll just skip this. Um, some of you might have actually heard about the gang rape of Asfa Banu a few years ago. This made the news. Um, she was a m Muslim, young Muslim girl, about eight years old, um, in the region of Jammu. Um, so she was not Kashmiri, but she was a she was part of one of the nomadic tribes there. Um, and essentially, since Modi has come to power, um, the current Prime Minister of India who is kind of buttressed with the Hindu supremacist ideology, um, even the Muslims in Jammu have been threatened. Um, and this is a group of kind of BJP RSS supporters that were um, demanding that the, the, the rapists of this young woman, that they, they be freed or they not be brought to justice. Um, so that's kind of some of the very kind of violent and um, vitriolic atmosphere that Kashmiris have had to um, have been subject to. So um, just some statistics of, of what all of this human rights violations has looked like. So there's been over 95,000 killings, um, 10, 109,000, over 109,000 uh, structures that have been basically burned to the ground, um, over 11,000 women that have been gang raped or molested, um, over 100,000 children that have been orphaned, and uh, eight to 10,000 um, people who've been disappeared since the 90s. Um, detention, uh, India has something called a Public Safety Act where it can basically pick up anyone that it deems a suspect for up to two years without any charge. So these are young people that are basically languishing in their detention centers or jails with no charge and being tortured. Um, and the unmarked graves, um, journalists are attacked and arrested as well, human rights def defenders physicians as well, basically anyone in the civil society who's speaking out, um, and really has been no recourse um, to any legal establishment to get um, justice for all these human rights violations. And because of the violence that's been meted out to the population, um, sometimes when people resist, they also resist violently, which again, continues uh, the cycle of violence. Rape has been used as a weapon of war, as I mentioned earlier. Um, because of so many men that were disappeared, there was something that happened called um, this phenomenon of the half-widows. So there were about uh, 5,000 half-widows who basically you didn't know, they didn't know whether their husbands were dead or alive, so they didn't know what their marital status was. So they were called half-widows because they couldn't be called um, you know, fully widows. Um, and especially because of the blinding of all these young uh, people, both mostly young men, but also some women, it, your, their education and their future has also been brought into question um, as well. Okay, so that brings us to August 5th and what happened on August 5th. Um, basically, uh, on August 4th, um, the Indian government, or a few days before August 5th, um, the Indian government was deploying an additional 35,000 troops um, in Kashmir. Um, they had ordered the tourists and the pilgrims to leave Kashmir. Um, they'd imposed a curfew um, on the population, and the army started to take over schools and colleges, businesses, and offices remained closed. Um, and they went on a mass arrest spree, arresting basically any one who had any influence in Kashmir, not just those leaders who were pro-freedom, but also leaders that supported them, that were their own client politicians. They arrested them. Um, and patients were asked to leave their hospitals, and there was a lot of fear and anxiety. And then finally, on August 4th, they instituted a complete communication clampdown where um, the internet, um, 
uh, phone lines, including cell phone service and landlines, were completely shut. Um, and basically what happened is that the Indian um, Home Minister, Amit Shah, Modi's right-hand man in many ways, went to the Indian Parliament, announced that um, the special status, the Article 370 that had been given to Kashmir was going to be taken away, and that Kashmir was going to be made into, um, was going to be split into Jammu and the Kashmir Valley, which would be one uh, union territory, and then Ladakh would be another union territory. Um, so this was obviously a cause for panic for a number of reasons. Um, even though Article 370, Kashmiris did not really hold any symbolic kind of loyalty to it because it had been eroded over the years. There was one part of Article 370 that was really important, um, which was enshrined in another article called Article 35A. And this basically gave the Kashmiri state um, the ability to determine who uh, was going to be, um, who was able to buy and sell property in the state. And with that being taken away, what the fear was, was that um, mainland Indians from India could come in and buy property buy the land and drive out the local population, which really, at, in terms of settler colonial logics, can only occur if there's an ethnic cleansing that happens, which is why um, Genocide Watch, which is an organization that kind of looks around the world and um, keeps tabs on these kinds of uh, uh, developments, put out a genocide alert for Kashmir. Um, so there was unprecedented militarization, a complete clampdown on communication. We had no, even the people themselves didn't know that this was happening in the initial period. Um, anyone, because there was so much army deployment on the streets, people were worried about protesting, although there were some instances of protests that had happened and that journalists were able to um, cover. Um, human rights observers say that up to 30,000 people have been detained. Some of them might have been released within those three months. Um, there was a crisis in the hospitals because people couldn't get to the hospitals because of the curfew or the transportation um, obstacles that were there. Um, the, hops uh, the hospitals were also told not to issue out any death certificates as a result of this, um, of this clampdown. Um, and of course, there's been a huge economic hardship because even though in the initial period there was an army instituted curfew, right now, um, except in those areas that the army believes are going to protest, which is where they'd have continued to have a curfew, in some of the other areas um, there's a civil disobedience movement. So people have basically just not been going to schools, uh, not been going to work, not buying or selling anything um, to kind of protest what's, what's happening. And this has resulted there's a recent report that came out. This has resulted in over a billion dollars loss um, in the past three months. Um, and there's been attempts by the international community to basically let India know, well, we want journalists, foreign journalists, to come into Kashmir. Um, Indian journalists are allowed, but many of them report for Indian media and don't necessarily have, um, you know, they're reporting kind of a lot of propaganda. Um, and, but there's been no international access given to foreign journalists or human rights observers. Um, and the state, on the other hand, has basically been saying that everything is fine. People are getting used to what's happening. They're happy with these new developments. Um, and that anyone who is protesting is a Pakistani or a terrorist, right? So this is the kind of the way in, ways in which they deploy the language of the war on terror against people there. Um, and that they've also been saying that the children are fine and that the schools are open um, and that development is happening. So um, these were some of the, the excuses given for, for all of this. Um, so just some of the, uh, the, uh, the headlines in the, in the press, in the international press. Um, the international press for the first time actually covered a lot of these developments. The New York Times, the BBC, the Washington Post. Um, has been covering um, some of these stories. So you can see what, what kinds of things are, are there. Um, and this BBC note is actually really interesting because the BBC covered an actual protest that had been happening. Um, and the Indian government had denied that this protest ever happened and they called the BBC fake news. Um, so the BBC had to basically say that, no, we completely go by our coverage. Um, we're trying to represent what's happening on the ground as much as possible. Um, so again, uh, up uh, until today, um, the la some of the landlines have been restored and some, tel uh, some of the cell phones are working, um, but the internet is still completely shut. And India leads the world, this is just in 2019, India leads the world um, in internet shutdowns in any country. And you can kind of see who the neighbors are, um, Yemen, Bangladesh, Iraq, Pakistan, 
countries that are not always necessarily known for their democratic values um, and have undergone a lot of civil strife and war and conflict. Um, but India kind of touts itself to be one of the largest democracies in the world um, and yet repeatedly clamps down, um, especially on freedom of expression in Kashmir. Um, so all of this is happening in the context of uh, the rise of Hindu, majoritarian, Hindu majoritarianism in India. Um, so the BJP, which is the political party that's in power, Narendra Modi was actually not allowed um, access. He was not given a visa to the U.S. for about nine years because of the role that he played in uh, the Gujarat pogrom against uh, the Muslims there in 2002. Um, and the BJP and the Hindu nationalist parties have always wanted to kind of completely annex Kashmir, um, to rid themselves of uh, Kashmir's, uh, to rid India of Kashmir's special status. And their idea is that Kashmir, and for not just Kashmir, but much of that region is a part of what they call a Hindu Rashtra and Hindu nation. Um, and Kashmir is integral to their imagination of what that Hindu Rashtra would look like. Um, which is why even though Congress, the other um, political main uh, political party in India, has also committed vast human rights abuses in Kashmir, um, they were always careful to maintain Kashmir's uh, special status because they knew that if they did away with that, there would be a huge um, resistance on the ground. So this is the map now. Um, the map that I showed you earlier was what the map officially was before August 5th. This is the new map of, um, so Kashmir and Jammu is made into one territory and Ladakh um, is separated from that and they're both directly controlled by the Indian government. Um, and what's important about this redrawing of this map is that people know that it's been done um, to decrease the Muslim demographics of this region. Um, because now India can say, well, you know, it's complicated. There's also a lot of Hindus um, as well, and they want to be a part of India. So it's to render this movement for self-determination obsolete um, and to say that, you know, plebiscite can't happen because it's too complicated. Some of the similar kind of narrative that's, um, that exists in the occupied territories in Palestine. Um, so some of the major implications of these recent developments is um, this threat of demographic change, where India wants to bring in um, Hindu-only settlements and change, um, change the demographic of the region. Um, economic coercion, they want to put in a series of development projects that will really not help Kashmiris, but will only continue to help India. Um, they want to extract a lot of the resources. Um, India already runs a lot of corporations in Kashmir, um, especially uh, that take away Kashmir's water resources. Um, water is really important, um, especially between this war between India and Pakistan, um, because five of the rivers um, that go into both countries actually originate in Kashmir. So development and extractive capitalism, all of that really plays a role in these new policies as well. Um, and so again, this is under this broader context of, a, of the rise of Hindutva in India. Um, things are not just happening in Kashmir, but they're kind of happening throughout India. Um, 1.9 million citizens of Assam have been stripped of their um, right to citizenship as well. Um, there's been increasing violence, lynchings, um, against uh, religious minorities in India, against Dalits in India as well. Um, anyone who's speaking out, forget being Kashmiri, but you know, even any Indians who are speaking out about these human rights violations have been told to go to Pakistan. So that's kind of just like the continuous um, narrative that you hear over and over again, or that they're being anti-national, or that they're being seditious. Um, so it is, it's a lot of institutions in India are increasingly being undermined um, by the rise of this, uh, the, uh, by the rise of Hindutva as a state policy. Um, in the U.S., after August 5th, the Kashmiri American diaspora, led by its allies, um, kind of became uh, mobilized and started to speak out about what's happening. They got their um, elected officials to either put out statements. Um, there's been two congressional hearings on Kashmir, which have spoken out about the human rights violations that have been happening. And this is really the first time Kashmir has even made it into the imaginations of American lawmakers. It's not, it hasn't really been a priority um, historically, but I think now people are worried that there is this potential of a war between India and Pakistan and that these are two nuclear armed countries. So there is, um, there is a concern about what's happening. Um, and, you know, for many Kashmiris uh, really situate their what's, hap what's happening or what is going to happen to them with um, what's been happening in, 
in Palestine. So on the ground in Kashmir, you'll see a lot of free Gaza um, uh, writing and graffiti, um, but also, you know, we want free Kashmir because they really see the struggles um, as being tied. Um, and I wanted to just, my last couple of minutes, talk about Stand with Kashmir, which was a um, diaspora, Kashmiri diaspora-led um, grassroots advocacy movement that actually started back in February, but really became very active after August 5th. Um, and they've uh, been, they're doing a lot of social media, raising awareness about what's happening, um, doing a lot of teach-ins and talks. Um, and it's entirely Kashmiri diaspora-led, and what they really stand for is the right to self-determination. But what's interesting, if you see the tweet, um, this is a journalist, an Indian journalist named Arti Tiku Singh, who came to the US to speak at one of the hearings, and she represented the Indian state's perspective. Um, uh, the, the group, the advocacy group, kind of did a thread on her, highlighting some of the Islamophobic and bigoted comments that she's made, and also how um, in the, the past she's praised, or in the past she's criticized Modi, but now she's praising him. Um, and she responded to this by saying that Pakistan's ISI, which is Pakistani intelligence, has tasked an entire team in Houston to dig stuff out on me, and look what they find. Um, do what you want or can Pakistan, you can't silence truth, and truth is on my side. So again, this is a group that's led entirely by the Kashmiri diaspora, um, but that whole narrative is erased. It's always kind of posited again as any kind of resistance to the Indian state must be Pakistani or Pakistan sponsored. Um, so this has been a thread that's kind of, as you, as you might have kind of recognized, has been going on throughout this 72 year period. Um, so uh, Professor Gill asked me to speak a bit about why this is important for us um, and why students in New Jersey should care about this issue. Um, the tentacles of Hindu nationalism don't just exist in India, they are very much in the United States. Um, not just on the issue of Kashmir, but just on the issue of religious minorities um, throughout India in general. Um, and I think that, especially now, a group of people that have literally been rendered invisible and silenced, it's important for us as students, um, as citizens who are and should be more globally minded and see the connections between what's happening in this country as well as what's happening around the world. We should really educate ourselves and learn more about um, some of these issues. So if you are interested, you can actually follow um, Stand with Kashmir on social media and they have lists of things that you can do and get involved and um, learn more. There's resources on their websites, books that you can read, films that you can watch. Um, and do a lot of outreach to the media because it's really important that the media narrative really begins to take the issue of Kashmir for what it is and centers Kashmiri voices. And any way that you can help that happen is really important. Um, so media outreach, social media, political advocacy is really important. Um, these, this issue was really only raised to the US Congress um, because of the political advocacy efforts of uh, a lot of Kashmiris and their allies in the US that would you know, insisted that they meet with their elected officials and tell their stories of how they were not able to get in touch with their family members, for example, because of the communication clampdown. Um, and then also get involved in your community and campuses by hosting additional events or film screenings, um, book clubs as well, um, and just to really, really educate um, yourselves and your communities. So, yes, um, a couple of websites that can give you more information. Um, and then if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take any by email. So, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Good. Take a for a yeah. second. Okay. Um, so, uh, Professor Gunzwell has given us a lot to think about, and we actually have um, a good amount of time for discussion. Um, if anybody has any questions, something that didn't quite make sense or something that connects with something else or, or anything you want to ask, um, please raise your hand. And we have this uh, new way of doing questions here, which is a, this is a microphone, and I can pass it to you. And uh, the mic part is here, so you just uh, speak into the mic. It's OK if you drop it, um, but this prevents us from passing it down. So who has the first question? Hi, my name is Zach. I'm a political science major here. So, um, first of all, uh, thank you for coming. This is very informative. Um, there was something, so 
human rights are obviously being violated here. And that's a big problem. That is something that needs to be addressed. Um, but at the same time, the introduction of another autonomous state in the region, to me, just seems like it would serve to exacerbate tensions rather than resolve them. So it's, it's almost like you're trading, you know, and obviously, like I said, human rights need to be addressed and the self-determination aspect of it needs to as well. But with India and Pakistan at such a, a high boiling point, would this introduction of another autonomous state, like I said, really serve to do anything but just make those tensions worse? Should we take a couple? Or? Yeah, should we yeah. Take a And also introduce yourself. Hello. Okay. I'm Will. I wanted to know if there are any good guys in the region, because the way you portrayed the issue made it seem like India hates them, Pakistan hates them. Is there anyone that the Kashmiris are looking up to, like anyone in Europe, anyone that they can rely on, or are they just, they, no matter what, they're screwed? Okay. Any others? Yeah. Carlos, history major. Uh, it seems that Kashmir is a contested ground by three major powers because I'm pretty sure China also wants a piece of that. Um, even if we are to settle the issue with India, what's to stop one of these three? These aren't, these aren't just simply nations. These are three major powers. What's to stop one power from just rolling in and just repeating the same process that the Indian national government is currently doing? I can start to answer some of these. Um, so I guess the first and the third <coughs> question might uh, were a little interlinked. Um, so I am thankfully not a political scientist. I'm a historian. Um, but of course, you know, when, when we do these talks, I think people hear all of this history and their immediate reaction is to kind of just say, oh my gosh, but how are we going to resolve this? And the immediate kind of um, impetus in people's mind is that this is so intractable, nothing can ever happen, and nothing can ever change, and if it does change, something else is going to happen. Um, and I kind of push away from that kind of, that kind of uh, mode of thinking, only because for me, two things are important. One is that the current situation right now is completely untenable. And it's not just untenable for Kashmiris who have been suffering for decades, it's also untenable for India and for Pakistan. Um, in the sense that both of these countries, especially since, part I mean, since partition, have really relied on this hyper-nationalistic jingoism. Um, their armies have, their, their defense industries have been inflated completely, taking away a lot of money from the people, their own people, their own citizens, that, um, that you know, their social welfare needs to be addressed. And so, you know, I don't have like a cookie cutter solution for what should happen. What I think definitely needs to happen is that the region should be demilitarized. Um, both Indian and uh, Pakistani troops need to leave. And that there should be a process in which Kashmiris can, should be at the table, right? Many of these treaties and things that have happened in the past, it's only been Indians and Pakistanis basically deciding over what will happen to the Kashmiris. Um, so they should be given a process to um, one, have all of these human rights addre uh, abuses addressed um, through different legal mechanisms, um, but then also have freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of trade. There were in the past kind of um, different possibilities or alternate possibilities that were imagined. I mean, we kind of think about everything in terms of nation states and borders and boundaries, but I really think, especially given what's been happening around the world in general, it's our responsibility to move beyond those kind of frameworks and reimagine what sovereignty looks like, what this idea of the nation state looks like. Um, because this is, it's not tenable at all, um, what's been happening there. So to not do anything about it just because of the in, you know, intractability of the situation um, is not doing anyone favors, especially not India and Pakistan as well. Um, that again, you know, goes to the question of um, these other powers um, of course, that, that threat remains, that, you know, Kashmiris might decide one thing and then China will come in the next day and occupy it. We already know what the Chinese are doing in, um, to the Uyghur population, for example. Um, but, you know, to, to think about the world in terms of all of those, like, different kind of war games, 
I'm just not sure how that's helping the people on the ground. Um, and what can the international community, what can we do to like buttress our institutions and to make this country also accountable in those international institutions to make sure that those kinds of things don't happen so unilaterally. Um, and so like Kashmir is part of the puzzle, but it's like a kind of a complete reimagination of the world order um, that needs to happen at large. Um, this is kind of how I, how I see the situation. And there was a question over here about, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, Kashmiri support. No, oh, support, yeah. Other states yeah, or yeah, yeah. Any good guys in the region that are community? Yeah, so, around? you know, Kashmir's relationship with Pakistan is really interesting. Um, for, even though many Kashmiris know that Pakistan is acting out of its own national interests, there's a lot of affective solidarity with Pakistan um, because for many Kashmiris, Pakistan is the only state that, um, that has spoken out and that has continuously brought the issue to the international arena. Um, so in Kashmir, you'll sometimes see people flying Pakistan flags. Um, and analysts some say that, well, yes, they're flying <coughs> Pakistan flags because that means that they want to merge with Pakistan. But others will say, well, they really just want to piss off the Indian soldiers <coughs> by, um, by putting out these uh, Pakistan flags. Um, so I wouldn't, I would say that like two, the two countries for sure are acting out of their own national interests, but for Kashmiris on the ground, India is certainly the bigger perpetrator of violence against them. And they have a bit of a more uneasy relationship with Pakistan. Um, the Pakistani leadership currently, Prime Minister Imran Khan, um, has, at least in terms of his rhetoric, he's shifted from prior Pakistani leadership, which was a lot more invested in this idea that Kashmir would become a part of Pakistan, and that's why they kind of completely got rid of the pro-independence movement. Um, but he has at least vocally expressed that um, Kashmiri should be given the right to determine their future, and if they want independence, then we would, you know, we would um, support them in that. Um, of course, when it actually comes to politics on the ground, it's hard to say what that would be. But India, I mean, is not even giving right. them an inch. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, sir. My name is Vicente, and I wanted to ask a question. Uh, is Gandhi's martyrdom being debased? Do people believe in South Asia that he was a pawn, per se? Because even civil rights leaders in this country don't necessarily <coughs> get respected over time, mm -hmm. and their agendas as well. Um, and also, I wanted to ask, are there indigenous regions in South America, in Asia, that are working together to kind of understand globalization? Mm -hmm. Also, are Eastern militias of Africa working with Indian militias? Yeah. Are there? Questions we can bunch up or maybe Connor? Hi, I'm Connor. Uh, earlier in the presentation, you had mentioned the um, that act that that uh, and had Indian soldiers ex uh, exempt from uh, crimes of, or mm -hmm. yeah, crimes that they committed. Is that still in place at this day? And is that and oh. Yeah, that's still in place. Yeah, very much so. Sorry. <laughs> Charles, are you there? I think there's one. One more. Yeah. Uh, my name's Adam. I uh, just a uh, question. What has been the U.S.'s standpoint on this? And then also, do you think, you kind of touched upon it briefly, but do you think that there's a calling globally right now to fix this problem? And is it um, a specific call to Britain to answer it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. Um, okay, so f to the first question about Gandhi, um, for sure, under this kind of new political order in India, um, Gandhi is completely being demonized by the by the Hindu nationalists. What is ironic, though, is that um, Modi actually, on I think it was Gandhi's death anniversary or something, he actually wrote uh, very recently an article in the New York Times, an op-ed in the New York Times praising Gandhi, despite the fact that members of his own party um, were, you know, responsible for, and kind of political ideology were responsible for killing um, Gandhi. So um, there is 
there's a lot of revisioning of history that's that's been happening um, under the the present moment there. Um, in terms of solidarities with other movements, indigenous movements, I think that's been one of the restrictions is that we know that these states, whether it's China, India, Israel, the US, all of these empires, they work together very closely. Um, but the people don't necessarily always do. Um, and I think that's what's really important is that there does, I mean, there is already so many parallels. I mean, I'm just um, looking at the, there are images from Chile, the protests that were there a couple of um, days ago, and there were uh, Chilean protesters that were also being blinded by something that the military there was using. And a lot of my Kashmiri friends were actually showing, well, look, look at how this is happening across the board. So um, this kind of military industrial uh, complex, the extractive capitalism, um, authoritarianism, this exists in all these spaces. And of course, it's important for people then um, to also establish solidarities with, with each other. Um, and right now, I mean, Kashmiris have also always looked historically to other struggles for um, inspiration, whether it's been the Palestinians or the Algerians, even Black Lives Matter. Um, but those kind of concrete relationships have not necessarily been um, established because in many ways they, they've been rendered, especially now, they've been rendered completely silent. Um, but a lot of that kind of building happens in the diaspora of Kashmiri Americans or people who live outside of Kashmir to see those connections. Um, the question, what was the other question about here? It was, a, it was a, the military impunity. Yes, so that's still in place. Also, yeah. the U.S., is that not the yes, U.S. The troops have and Trump just pardoned somebody about this? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Is, is there a law that kind of makes U.S. soldiers? Oh, okay. Um, uh, there, sorry, there was a question about the role of the U.S., which yeah. I can answer. Um, so in the f during the Cold War, um, the U.S. was actually closely allied to Pakistan um, and had a bit of an uneasy relationship with India because the um, uh, Prime Minister Nehru had um, declared that he was a part of the, you know, that India would be a part of the non-aligned movement. Um, so initially, the U.S. would kind of take Pakistan's position or at least try to keep the dispute somewhat internationalized. Um, since 9-11, and especially since India has kind of emerged as a global power that is very open to um, liberalism and capitalism, the U.S. is trying to very awkwardly manage its relationship and its role with both countries because it needs Pakistan on the war on terror, but then it also needs India because of its um, economy and all, of, and all those things. So um, the U.S., especially since Clinton time, Clinton's time, Clinton, I think, tried to be a lot more active in trying to um, bring forth some kind of an agreement. Um, but since then, Kashmir has really been on the back burner. Up until the, I mean, all of these human rights violations occur, these summers of protest and violence occur, um, but you'll rarely hear kind of even a peep out of what's of uh, US elected officials or the, um, the leadership. Um, since August 5th, though, because there is now a real danger of total destabilization in the region, because the US needs Pakistan and its efforts in Afghanistan, um, it doesn't need another kind of tinderbox to completely um, open in the region. So they've been trying to put some pressure on India to kind of either go back or you know stop the human rights violations. Um, but there's two things is that the Indian economy and the idea of investing in India is really important for American corporations. Um, but also the Indian American lobby is also very, very active in promoting India's interests. Um, and they have been super active since August 5th to kind of pose this as an issue of terrorism um, and that, you know, Indians are the only true allies of the U.S. Uh, you wanna, I think we have a couple back there. <coughs> you want to catch? Mm -hmm. I have the students. Yeah. Hi, my name is Brandon. I'm a political uh, science student. Uh, I just have a question about um, the ideology of Hindu nationalism under Modi, is this a, like a recent trend or has it been like around for a long time? Yeah. Anyone else? You want to get yours off? Sure. What do you think? Is it going to next one? Oh, no. One of my questions was not addressed. Um, so, Starting to notice a trend even to this. We've seen it in Russia with its revanchism into Eastern Europe, China with its very with this very Han-centric ideology that's been taking place. 
for the Uyghurs and other minorities. And now I'm seeing it in India with this rise of this Hindu nationalism. Is this a trend that you see that's going to be continuing in other parts of, um, or is this just something that's just completely out of the blue? Is it the militia question? there's any connections between the Oh, the militia. Um, no, not no. so much. I only bring that up because yeah. of like conflict and serial, that's all, and American corporations was brought up. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Others, do you want to get those two then? Because they're kind of similar. Yes, yeah. So the rise, okay, so Hindu nationalism and the rise. Um, so the Hindu nationalism thing is definitely not new. Um, the, the RSS was founded in the 1920s. Um, and I mean, they were obviously they their party members killed Gandhi, so they were active. Um, they've always, I mean, because India kind of touted itself to be a secular democracy, in many ways they were kind of kept to the side, but they would <laughs> rear their um, head from time to time. And really, it's been since the 80s and the 90s where what you know hist anthropologists have called the saffron wave, um, where with the same um, India becoming liberalized. Um, but also this religious nationalism has taken root in very insidious ways. And then the BJP was formed. Um, and in the early 90s there were, um, and more recently the Supreme Court actually uh, issued out on the Babri Masjid where um, Hindu vigilante groups um, destroyed the Babri Masjid, which is a mosque, um, claiming that the, the it was built originally on a temple the, for the Lord, Lord Ram. Um, and the Supreme Court just recently decided on this case that it, they that this would be a temple because um, there was a dispute between the Muslims and the Hindus over who it would go to. So um, this has been ongoing for decades, but they're just somehow even more emboldened now with Modi in power, um, as well as some of these global things that you've been reflecting upon as well, um, where of course we kind of see a rise of this authoritarianism and fascism around the world. Um, and I don't necessarily see it ending until like people really, really push back. But the, um, the, the, the cost of that is very high and we've seen that in all of these places where um, you protest and now the technology is also what's really scaring me is how involved and how rapid the technological gaze of the modern state is as well with people being surveilled on such a vast scale. You saw that in Hong Kong and the protests there. Um, and a lot of that is also happening in Kashmir. So for the first time, um, the people that we were able to speak to have said that there's been drones that they've been hearing um, that are just kind of scouting out the space. And so, I mean, it's, I think in general, we live in really dark times, but I would hope that we don't become hopeless or full of despair because of that. I think it just makes it that the onus is on us to really um, speak up, educate ourselves, and also see how all of these things are connected. Um, because the US and your role as a student in New Jersey is intrinsically connected to all of these developments. Um, so I think that's, that's what's on us now. Last question. Thank you. Also, that was very uh, useful. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you know, I mean, just in terms of the images you put up and just in terms of how you framed, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I'm absolutely appalled at what happened. I had occasion to visit, uh, you know, Kashmir last year because I s sort of sensed that maybe I wouldn't get too many opportunities to go to a place that I knew growing up. Uh, but, you know, what is the place for, I mean, even when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, like an independent Kashmir, or you talk about, you know, uh, Kashmir's struggle for uh, self-determination, uh, we're talking in terms of militant nationalisms, uh, we're talking in terms of identitarian uh, nationalisms, uh, you know, uh, uh, where Kashmir is between, between you know, a, a, a Muslim-identified Pakistan or a Hindu-identified majoritarian uh, uh, India. Where is the place for syncretism, uh, syncretism in this narrative? Especially because you so, you know, well-identified Kashmir's very syncretic history. I mean, uh, you know, why are we not talking more about Kashmir and things that bring people together on uh, issues that are cultural and more, you know, what about nomadic communities? You know, you know all these histories uh, get erased in, in, in this kind of a narrative where, you know, we're just identifying people as Muslim 
or uh, you know, or, or Hindu, you know, Dogra oppression, for instance, as you uh, identify, or the Muslims who got man you know massacred by them. Uh, what about you know other ways in which the Kashmiris themselves see themselves? Beyond, you know, beyond the, uh, these kinds of violent, uh, uh, violence-ridden histories. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a good question. I think people on the ground always have a tendency to see themselves in more imaginative ways, but unfortunately the state doesn't, whether it's the colonial state, whether it's a princely state, or whether it's the post-colonial state. Um, the state, especially in these kind of colonial contexts, they divide people. That's what they do. They give certain groups of people privileges over, over others. Under the Dogras and then later the Indian state, um, Kashmiri Pandits, for example, were given certain privileges that were not given to the Kashmiri Muslims. So it's not that the people on the ground are the ones that are creating or wanting these divisions amongst themselves. It's how they are being managed and operated from the top. Um, so, but then, of course, I mean, I think you can always there's been spaces where then people also only kind of see the movement as one of, you know, like a Muslim militant nationalism. Um, but for the most part, I would say that Kashmiris overall, whether they're, um, especially in Kashmir, um, you know, their identity is Muslim. That's not something that they can, like, kind of push aside. But that doesn't mean that that identity necessarily means that it's exclusivist. Um, even some of the more kind of um, hardline leaders of the pro-freedom movement have articulated that Kashmir is a space that is not just Muslim but also Hindu and Pandit, or sorry, Hindu and Sikh, and they've wanted the Kashmiri Pandits to come back um, and live with their Muslim neighbors, I mean, and not just kind of be put in the, into these settlements. Um, so I think you'll always find this, the, the, the unfortunate thing is that this, this term syncretic, um, what it doesn't do, um, and kind of like this composite religious nationalism doesn't do, is it doesn't um, take into account the kinds of divisions that exist as a result of these um, systemic issues in society. Um, so of course it's great to talk about syncretism, but when um, your neighbor is given certain privileges because they are of one religious community and you are not that community, then syncretism kind of is, is hard. But of course, you know, there's throughout Kashmiri history, um, Sufi, um, uh, uh, Hindu, Sikh, there's been shared spaces where people go to the same shrines, they visit the same, um, you know, healers, faith healers, and so on. And that, that always exists in all of these societies. But in moments of heightened tension, those religious identities get mobilized against each other. So with that, uh, we should thank our speaker.